pedophiles masquerading as sex education teachers and UN bureaucrats now admit, they admit, that a primary aspect of their new pornographic sex education program is to simply teach children about pleasure. So now that they openly confirm their desire to titillate children, can we arrest them or do we have to wait until we find them holding class in windowless vans next to the candy store? I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we're talking about sex ed proponents who now admit the goal of youth comprehensive sex ed is not so much about the birds and the bees as it is about teaching kids how different types of sex can give you pleasure, literally. And so ask yourself this question. First of all, how annoyingly paternalistic is this? With all due respect, which is to say very little, kids know what feels good. You don't have to teach kids what feels good. Babies, before they can think and reason, they know what feels good and what doesn't. This weird notion that you've hijacked American public schools and you're spending hours and hours and hours and hours over the course of a year teaching little kids about sex is now primarily to teach them what feels good. You're a- and you're actually lying to these kids. You're now telling these kids that or sexual, sexual behaviors like anal intercourse, which is not pleasant for anybody, unless you, I suppose, allow yourself to become acclimated to it, that now is pleasurable, we're told, right? So pleasure. I go back to what I said at the opening here. If the purpose of teaching sex, radical sex education to kids is to titillate them, how is this not child pornography? That's a great question. Well, we had one good thing, I think, come from COVID-19. The fact that kids weren't in school during May, which was the hashtag sex ed for all month, is one positive that we got. But on social media platforms over and over, it was sex ed for all month. And it, basically, we've had people take a look at all the different posts that have been using that hashtag sex ed for all and they're teaching as you said about sexual pleasure and it's now being included in the language of quote medically accurate and that's according to uh kathy rue senior fellow and director of human dignity at family research council she wrote the facts of life have not changed but inclusivity and sex positivity and other popular buzzword concepts have changed sex education now she's the author of a new brochure it's titled sex education in public schools sexualization of children and lgbt indoctrination so she's observing what these so-called sex ed uh educators are doing And she's saying that the many studies have demonstrated comprehensive sex ed has failed to achieve its stated goal and resulted in increased student sexual activity. School systems are devoting up to 70 hours of classroom time per child to sex ed, with many of those hours now being spent on the concept of sexual rights and radical sexual ideology for youth. The American College of Pediatricians also asked the question, after 40 years, 40 years of comprehensive sex ed in schools, Why are STDs at epidemic levels? Right. So what do you got? Exactly what this is. It just is such liberal logic, right? You ban guns in the name of safety. You 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 prevent the 99 percent of gun owners who are responsible to own guns. And what do you get? You get places like Chicago. And now also defund the police. And defund the police. This is another one. And defunding the police is going to be another one. But this is remarkable. You, you, as you said, for 40 years, ever since the Reagan administration, with its emphasis on abstinence only, you have had comprehensive sex education getting worse and worse every decade to the point now that it's almost laughable. You're spending more time sexualizing kids than you are teaching them literacy. Having said that, that one thing that's really frustrating about this is what do you expect you're going to get? You really think you're going to get informed kids who are now more so- sexually responsible? No. You're getting more sex. You're getting higher level of STDs here. You're getting more kids being exposed to the propaganda of places like Planned Parenthood, who underwrites much of this garbage. Well, and you have the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. We call it UNESCO. Uh, they have released their guidance, and it suggests numerous learning objectives related to the topic of friendship, love, and romantic relationships. And it's supposed to be going from ages 5 to 18. And here's what they do. If you're in ages 9 to 12, your learning objective is to describe ways that human beings feel pleasure Mm -hmm. from physical contact. Example, kissing, touching, caressing, sexual contact throughout their life. Ages 9 to 12. And you've talked about this with the pleasure. And could you, in this progressive sexual climate that they're teaching our kids, if I were to say as a uh, a 9-year-old, 
my mommy t feels pleasure when daddy whips her. My daddy feels pleasure when mommy drips hot candle wax all over his nipples, right? How, how, you wouldn't even be able to protest, would you? Not, I mean, could, not according if to you, that learning objective. Because look, if it's all the ways that people experience, like, well, you know, what if, what if mommy's a kingster into getting whipped and, fl and flogged, right? How, where do you draw the line well, between sexual And it's blood? not even, how do you know the difference? You don't know the difference. There's the no kids, difference. So the kids in won't the minds even of these know. people, there's no difference. Yeah, and, and so that if mommy or daddy is actually being truly abused, the the kid being taught at school that well that must be their pleasure and and god forbid the kid then be like well i want that to happen to me too anyway we're, and listen to the quote you know. again describe ways that human beings feel pleasure from physical contact e.g kissing touching caressing sexual contact sexual contact right so because a a 40 year old man can sexually pleasure a 12 year old boy you see where this is going right this is yeah it's going There's down no boundaries right quote State that they must, this curriculum states that sexual feelings, fantasies, and desires are natural and not shameful. Take away innocence, take away shame to those two things. Don't let the kids be innocent. Don't let them be kids. And ki The average seven-year-old never worried about their gender before. Now they're worried about it. Let them be in it. Don't let them be innocent and don't let them be ashamed of anything, right? So what that means, anything goes. And that's that one you just stated was actually for ages 12 to 15. But if you're 15 plus, the key idea, they say, the key idea is that engaging in sexual behaviors should feel pleasurable and comes with associated responsibility for one's health and well-being. But they and don't yet, actually And yet, in the same breath, that. if you're a little kid who says anal sex or oral sex or whatever kind of sex is wrong for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they'll persecute you, right? So you should be feel you're not allowed to not be sexually pleasured by the things they say you ought to be. The minute your own sexual morality runs in the face of what they consider pro, pro, um, uh, what they consider to be pleasurable, then that's when the problem's going. That's when they're going to program your kid, right? To make sure that something he finds uncomfortable, he'll better damn well get comfortable with pretty quick if it's LGBTQ related. Well, our next story is by our very own Alex Newman, who wrote for the Newman Report that New York City taxpayers are footing a bill of $200,000 for a director of mindfulness. Now, Barnaby Springs, what a name, Barnaby Springs, his job is to force feed controversial religious practices to the child inmates and direct district employees in his care, according to Alex. That includes Hindu practices known as yoga and Buddhist meditation techniques. And Spring has actually said on mindful.org that specializing in promoting spiritual practices, this is specifically to begin to put the social emotional needs of children in a place where it's just as important, if not more important, than academic learning. Bingo. We are no longer sites of academics because that means competition, it means grades, it means tests, it means exams. No. We are now places of squishy feel goodness. Mm -hmm. And and just notice the uproar, moms and dads. If this were a two hundred thousand dollar a year a, a bureaucrat who had been hired by a public school system to teach your kids to pray there because is. there's not a single thing that Eastern meditation techniques, which are religious at their core, mm -hmm. there's not a single thing they can do for your kids that praying can't. And so you will never in a million years have your kid be allowed to pray. But if you want us to meditate in a spiritual way, and so I ask you again, you, you, by bringing this stuff in, you are bringing religion into the classroom. It's just non-Western religion, which makes it acceptable to these bureaucrats. $200,000 you are paying a bureaucrat whose sole job is to be in charge of mindfulness in the schools. Mindfulness. This is no longer a public school system. This is no longer an academic endeavor. This is a commune. This is a kibbutz. This is a commune. This is a this is hate Ashbury in the sixties. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with teaching your kids anything but squishy progressive spirituality. I like how you said his sole job. Soul job. His soul, soul job. He's well, another part job. of his job is arranging mindfulness lessons and programs for the mm -hmm. district staff. So not only are you paying to have your kids be taught, you know, these yoga or Hindu or whatever his mindfulness is feeling at the moment, the district staff get to be paid to do that too. Like you're paying for them to be able right. to in feel words, good. The indoctrination well. has to go both ways. Oh yeah. It's and where, is the, where are our liberal progressives out there screaming cultural appropriation? 
You would think. These are pasty white dudes, pasty white dudes who are appropriating the sacred and spiritual traditions of the East. Would you be okay if they all wore obis to honor Japanese Culture Day? Would you be okay no, they if they wore saris? Should they all wear saris while they do this as a way of honor? Or is this cultural appropriate? What, on the day you're doing yoga and Eastern meditation, are you gonna f uh, serve up naan? Ooh. Right, and sog, Indian food in the yeah. cafeteria? Or is that not for what we learned from our college campuses? Cultural, cultural appropriation. appropriation. Bunch of little white kids, hell, a bunch of little white and black and Hispanic kids sitting in the cafeteria eating sog, right, and meditating. And if I tried to do that, this would be cultural appropriation. You're paying somebody $200,000 a year to, to literally appropriate another, the, an entire continent's cultural appropriation, take it from them, and no one has a problem with this. Not to say, to say nothing of the fact that keep your stupid religion out of, we're gonna keep Christianity out of classrooms and Judaism, let's keep the other stupid religions out too. You can't, this is the double, the double speak of the yep. liberal, right? What's well, good for me is not good for thee. Well, if they would even hire a director of Bible studies, we'll oh say, right? Half the cost, half off, even hey, a tenth. Tell me how useful <laughs> it would be to have kids say the Psalms every day. One day have another psalm in class and There's work through. There's music the, class right there. Absolutely just... beautiful, absolutely mindful, all right? But that'll never in a million years happen. So mind. you could um, impose Eastern spirituality on our kids, but the, the spirituality they may be raised with is verboten. Yeah. Two hundred thousand dollars a year yeah uh local media has actually reported that taxpayers are also paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for administrators and educators to go on these yoga and meditation retreats that feature massage mm. and facials and even a buddha bar which i don't even know what that is a buddha bar buddha bar I, so is many, it where you go to eat and so get as many things buddha? cross my head and probably alas, the propriety re prohibits, prohibits me to say any of them. Okay, well, let's keep those little thoughts keep in moving. your head there. Well, uh, as we know, the school's chancellor, Richard Carranza, your best friend, oh, God. is in the middle of also trying to cut hundreds of millions of dollars from their public schools, and, and yet... They, right, <laughs> they don't have the money for online for education. Nothing. They don't know how to do mm -hmm. it, right? They have all, But they have all this money to send their teachers and their administrators to spas. They Quit pretending that really, you're sending them to spas, right? Well, he that guy even admitted, Spring admitted, Barnaby, Barnaby admitted that it's like your what social emotional need is Barn more all i gotta Barnaby. say is barnaby springs is there a manix falls out there <laughs> or a cannon <laughs> autumn since we're dealing with 70s detectives is there a columbo spring out there i love columbo murder she wrote anyway two hundred thousand that as well dollars angela lansbury Story three of the day. Did you know that between 1987 and 2012, American colleges and universities have added about a half million, 500,000. We were talking about $200,000. How about a half million highly paid administrative jobs during that time period? The National Association of Scholars, which is actually a nonprofit advocacy group for the American professors. Not sure if you're a part of that, but uh, they want universities to cut some of these little administrative bloating positions so that before that they actually accept any of the COVID-19 relief. So professors in this group have said, you know what, cut some of the bloat so that basically our jobs are saved. Give me that opening statistic one more time. Between 1987 and 2012, American colleges and universities added about 500,000 highly paid administrative jobs. Administrator, and, and I would bet you probably 80% of those are diversity related. Mm, if you look at, yes, yes. Uh, depending on, they didn't break it down that way, but yeah. The National Association of Scholars who is saying, look, stop hiring and get rid of some of these administrators. The exactly right. Now, the, the NAS, the National Association of Scholars, is a, the, it's the counter group to the MLA. You may have heard of the Modern Language Association. This is the great big umbrella organization that uh, most uh, university professors sub, uh, subscribe to. It is the most irresponsibly, foolishly communist organization you're ever going to find. It literally is a, they make Antifa look like, Boy Scouts, 
prior oh. to all the oh, sexual... Oh, yeah, I was going to say, what? Yeah. Okay. It's horrible. And so the NAS is actually responsible scholars, the National Association of Scholars, put together an organization who actually focuses on the concerns of academia without giving in to liberal pieties or, or reducing education to progressive orthodoxies. So to be honest with you, yes, it is an organization I've published with, the NAS. It's a very small, and boy, do my colleagues, colleagues hate that. Oh, <laughs> they hate it. When I publish something from the NAS, they just grind their teeth because it's not the MLA. It's not the MLA. I had one smug punk in my department who was going over my uh, last post-tenure review who kept insisting to another one of my colleagues on that committee, it's not the MLA. It's not the MLA. <laughs> right? It's not. They have more bona fides, more real scholarship, and less politics. It's not the MLA. It's not the MLA. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just guessing who that is. Anyway, uh, in their report, they said that for far too long, American higher education has exploited the hopes of students and their families, as well as the goodwill of legislators and the American public. Millions of Americans have been plunged deeply into unsupportable debt in order to fund huge increases in college administrative costs over the last 30 years. Here's some statistics. Administrative positions, including non-instructional staff, now consume more than 50% of higher education payroll costs. At the same time, colleges and universities offer a trivialized curriculum, yep, marked by animosity to America. Our country deserves much better, and we can get it. And, you know, this is something we've talked about week to week on here. The the real expense at universities is not the fact. I know the faculty are radicalized. I know the faculty are monolithic to the point of being discriminatory, and I get that. Mm -hmm. But it's not the faculty where the money's going. It's these ridiculous administrators. You could literally cut, cut down 70% of the, of the typical college's administrative uh, foundation. Just get rid of it, and nothing would change. And, and the more of these de uh, administrators you hire who are committed to things that have nothing to do with education are the ones who are ruining the classroom. They're the ones who are saying, we, oh, something happened to an African-American 400, 4,000 miles away, right, 2,000 miles across the country. We, we have to give every, like University of Washington, right, who kids demanded it and they got it. We talked about this last week. Kids said, hey, Floyd, uh, hey, George Floyd, stress, we want breaks. And so what, what, what African-American kids were given breaks. This is directly associated to the number of non-academic staff that you have. I, I, whenever, whenever there's a problem on my campus, whenever, there's a, whenever I get in a Title IX, <laughs> it's always non-professors I have to deal with. It's the equity and affirmative action. It's these endless associate provo, associate deans and associate um, chancellors, vice chancellors. Oh, my God. <laughs> get rid of them immediately. They're worthless. All this doesn't, it doesn't promote education. It promotes sociology. It's time for some real education. Decimus Junius Juvenalis, known down through history as Juvenal, was a Roman poet active in the late 1st and early 2nd century AD. He's best known for writing a collection of satirical poems known as the satires. The details of the author's life are unclear, although references within his writings help date his working years. Juvenal wrote 16 known poems divided among five books. All are satires, which comprised a wide-ranging discussion of society and social mores composed in dactylic hexameters. Dactylic hexameters. That was the poetic, preferred prophetic form, pro poetic form of the ancient Greeks, and the Romans borrowed it too because Homer was such a great influence on them. And Juven, we got to talk about satire here. Oh, in yes. Restrictive dictatorial societies, including the, the, on the coming progressive tyranny that Americans are about to get see, get a lot worse now. We saw it all through COVID when they took away our rights, our rights of freedom of association. And now you saw it during the riots, right, where the police were made to stand down, looting and pillaging happened, and there were no public, no formal response from our big city Democrats. And you got politicians now. This is what's coming to you, too. The first thing that dies in this kind of a system is satire. Satire is the ability to mock your enemies, to mock bad ideas, to mock bad policies. In this culture, think about The Onion, which is liberal satire, almost exclusively liberal satire, and Babylon Bee, which is more conservative satire. Interesting, I have not heard anything over the last two years about The Onion being sued for any reason. No. Nope, as long as you're, 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 you're killing conservative, you're goring conservative mm. oxes, it's all good. How many times has Babylon Bee been 
sued, including just last week. I was just going to say, right, they right. just got... Yeah. Right, so if you satire the left, the people in power, you sat satirize progressives, they're going to sue you, right? So the Onion can do what it does untrammeled, but heaven help you if you do it back to them. And you think about some of the great satires and satirists in history, Jonathan Swift, his modest proposal. <laughs> what better way to shed light on the dying Irish babies than to satirically propose that we eat them, right? Yeah. It's such a well-done satire that it opened the eyes of the world to the degradation that was taking place. Satire is necessary. And Juvenal, really in many respects, is the first great satirist in Western culture. We go back to him again and again. Juvenalian satire is actually a mode of satire that has uh, uh, endured on to this day. And Juvenal is really quite fascinating. Go throw up the, the clip I've got. I mean, I could give you lots of examples, but in a short five-minute segment here, just give you one, right? I'll read it to you. Juvenal writes, now the flames are hissing. Bellows and furnace are bringing a glow to the head revered by the people. The mighty Sejanus is crackling. Then from the face regarded as number two in the whole of the whole world come pitchers, basins, saucepans, and piss pots. Frame your door with laurels. Drag a magnificent bull whitened with chalk to the capital. They're dragging Sejanus along by a hook for all to see. Sejanus was an actual guardsman a high-ranking member of the Praetorian Guard, uh, the Emperor Tiberius's loyal following of guardsmen that defended the emperor. And Sejanus used his position to murder, brutally murder anybody he disagreed with, used the position to engage in a prescriptive war against anybody who offended the emperor or anybody who bothered him. And so he made himself the second most power of, powerful person in Rome, really behind the emperor's back, by killing his enemies for no good reasons other than he had that power. And uh, uh, juveniles remarking on that moment when the worm turned, where Sejanus, the kingmaker, who, who destroyed so many lives for his own gain, had the axe turned back on him. Uh, revolution in the palace, you had uh, the uh, letters were reported to the Senate that accused Sejanus of treason and acting against the wishes of the emperor. The emperor turned his back on him, and they literally, as they did with traitors, they, dra they murdered him, and they dragged his lifeless body by hooks through the streets of Rome before they dumped him into the ocean over the cliffs. Remarkable what happened to Sejanus. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a story of hubris, right? How power corrupts absolutely. Go back to the clip real quick. And, and now the flames are hissing. Now the sacrifices are being offered. Now the people of Rome are going to watch a slaughter. Only this time, it is the mighty Sejanus who is crackling. Then from the face regarded as number two in the whole Roman world, now are flung pitchers and basins and saucepans and piss pots. Frame your door with laurels. Drag a magnificent bull whitened with chalk as a sacrificial to the animal to the capital. Give thanks because they're dragging Sejanus along by a hook for all to see. And in I, Claudius, the great 70s uh, miniseries, Sejanus was played by a very young Patrick Stewart. First fun fact of the day. You've got another one for us. Stealing my fun facts. All right. Well, as always, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a question for our Friday Q&A, visit freedomproject.com slash askduke or send us a message on social media. And as a reminder, Freedom Project Academy's live online school is currently enrolling new students for the upcoming school year. Request your free packet at freedomforschool.com. That's freedom, F-O-R, school.com. Now, I guess it's the second fun fact of the day, since we're talking about bloat, did you know those cruciferous veggies, your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli, your cauliflower, that's what actually makes you bloat, but you can have some hot water and some lemon to deep bloat. Basically, this is still an encouragement, though, to eat your veggies. No know, I love my veggies. with pizza. And that's going to do it for this show. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Until next time, get a little broccoli on your pizza and stay educated, my friends.